at that time. Oh, good. We got the recording on. Yep. And um, and, and so there will, will be some recording, some questions then. And then after that, Anne will talk about the more recent parts of our retrofit, followed by another question and answer session. And so, um, as you gathered from the title, we've been uh, retrofitting this house for a while. We moved in in 2001. And I'm mostly going to talk about the first 10 years when we were doing quite a lot of DIY and, and I'm going to now just give you a little bit of entry into, into the house. Um, and I just say that you will see quite a few links on these slides, but you will be shared the slides afterwards. So you can click on those links or indeed right at the end of the slide set, there's a reference slide just full of links if you want to go to that afterwards. So I think, yes, we're now having a little walk into the house. Here's Anne, just to show you roughly how it is. You'll notice we've got carpet tiles going up the stairs. They're made from recycled fishing nets. There in the sitting room is our wood stove, which I'll talk about in a bit. And coming into the kitchen with a sort of dining and seating area, you'll see the stock cat scaffolding out outside there because uh, we haven't got the external wall insulation up yet. But, um, oops. Uh, and then up here is our heat pump. And these two Veluxes have just been replaced with triple glazed ones. And so, oh, don't want that again. So, as I was saying, we've done a lot of DIY easy wins, you might call them, mostly fairly small jobs. That, in fact, links to a list of things, easy wins you might consider doing. And pretty much the first thing we did was loft insulation. We moved in in May, and so we made blooming sure by the first winter, we had some loft insulation. There was zero, which in a way makes it easier. We didn't have to clear out scrappy old dirty insulation. Oh, sorry, I'm waving my cursor around, aren't I? And so you can see that um, we first put down this rubber glass up to the depth of the joists, and then we covered that with quite a thick Celatex plastic insulating board, and then in fact some chipboard on top so that it could carry the weight of things we're storing there. But uh, lots of kinds of loft insulation. In fact, we did have um, another part of the loft where there were it was already boarded. And we asked a builder who we had in to insulate under those boards and it looked okay. And then afterwards, we were looking with our little um, infrared thermometer and it didn't look right, the temperatures. And uh, we had a closer look and all they had done was stop insulation under the edges of these boards and not lifted them and filled the space. In the meantime, this company went bust so we had to put that down to experience. Um, and so also we've done, we installed a, an efficient combi gas boiler and um, we did a lot of secondary glazing, which I'm not going to go into detail now, but nearly all the windows were single glazed and we put this extra secondary glazing layer on them in different ways. And that made a big difference. And, and then we did a lot of draft proofing. This was a really drafty house. In fact, Anne's got a way of, are you going to show that later? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show it later. Um, oh, sorry. This is a good uh, ceiling strip for the front door. When it closes, it presses against this seal. 
and really seals it up nicely. We have a lot of uh, floorboards with gaps between them, both on the ground floor and upstairs. And so we use this product Draftex. It has a kind of um, round rubber uh, foam strip. And this is a short clip showing how you put it in. You just sort of have a tool that just neatly presses it down into the gap. And this comes in varying thicknesses, depending how wide your gap is. Um, then we did a lot of underfloor insulation. We were been advised, you know, we, we had an architect friend around and she said, hmm, I do underfloor insulation next. And so um, we put, this is fiberglass, rock wall, a uh, rock wall, sorry. <laughs> And uh, in fact, you can see, you can probably get the hint that under the floor, there is a space about 18 inches deep. And this is how all the um, older homes in Cambridge are likely to be with suspended wooden floors. So you have these choice, suspending your floorboards. The space underneath must be ventilated to avoid the timbers rushing. You should have air bricks at the front and the back of the house to let cold outside air blow through and so until we had the insulation down all you had was between us and the outside air was floorboards and so putting in this is the diagram showing 200 millimeters of rock wall sorry it says glass fiber there yeah. <laughs> um and uh, so under the joists, under the joists, and and the, the insulation is hung in nets that we uh, put there. Anyway, more details in another download. In the hall here, for example, we it didn't want to take it up these boards. It would have been pretty destructive, but already. Electricians and plumbers and people have lifted boards. It may be every one and a one point two meters, and so that was easy to open those up again. And has here a um, a little piece of Solitex foam insulation, and she could reach under the floorboards and just temporarily glue this in place with some instant grab adhesive and then fix it in place with a batten, a thin, thin piece of wood with a, some nails. She could bang the nails in sideways into the joist to hold up this insulation. So this is quite a lot more effective for a given thickness than uh, rock wall, but um, this probably isn't such good insulation, but it's, it's pretty effective. And it's much nicer as a job to do, actually. Um, as you can see, I was just on the, I was, I was, you know, in 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 the open air, not not um, as we had been earlier, trying to be underneath the floorboards. And we didn't have to take up all the floorboards. And you can you can see I'm actually I'm actually lying on a piece of, of thermofleece. Yeah. Um, this this grey is, is a piece of old thermofleece insulation, so I'm I'm very comfy with my angle poise tucked under the floorboards yeah, um, to light. to give light. So you know when you've got really nice floorboards that you can't bear to pull up. Um, I, I, I recommend this actually. I think it's, it's, I think it's, it's quite a good solution. Good. And okay. And so another thing we did was um, added fans to this radiator here. It's, as you can see, it's pretty small. And I've got another video where um, you're going to hear about it from me in the recording. Our gas central heating runs this small radiator. In fact, it's a bit too small for this room, and so we wanted to increase its heat output. So we cut this board with three computer fans on it. So here's the back of the board with the three fans mounted. They're connected via the screw connectors and all powered from this 12 volt metal power supply that is switched by this small bimetallic switch 
that's attached to the radiator and only turns the fans on when the radiator is warmer than about 30 degrees C. The three fans blow air through the radiator and then the shelf pushes the warm air into the middle of the room. Our gas oh, central... Sorry. I don't want to start again. I'm sorry, Dan, yeah. you'll find uh, links to um, a document giving the details of that. If you wanted to do something similar for yourself, you can adapt that idea for any shape of radiator. And it may be relevant to people as well. If you're having a, a heat pump fitted, then you probably want your radiators to have more output so that you can run them at the lower temperatures that heat pumps are efficient at. Okay. Um, okay, so in 2007, we fitted this wood stove in our sitting room at the front. And it's quite small. In fact, fortunately, Anne chose it. It just fits inside our original fireplace that uh, the Edwardians would have had one of the many open coal burning fires that they used. And so, but this is a wood stove that just fits in. This one gives out, I think, four and a half kilowatts. It's, it's, so. it's, it's a four kilowatt more so. And we're very pleased with it. And so, and so we can, uh, there's another dock with the details on this. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's really beautiful. I think we both like uh, lighting fires. I think we're probably closet pyromaniacs. And um, but there was a problem. And the problem that has become more apparent is air pollution. And so this would link to um, a, a article um, about that. The main way, it also sort of advises how you could reduce that. And the main ways are by having really dry firewood, by laying a fire so you can light it, get it burning really quickly and let it burn hot when it won't give off much smoke. And then like, Typically of an evening, we, we won't feed the stove at all for a good hour before we're going to bed because uh, you don't need to be leaving it blazing um, later on. So we're trying to minimise our use of wood a bit like smokers giving up. And OK, here's my final slide. And so this is about another aspect of the home We've made it as far as we can so that it's cool and comfortable during heat waves, which we have to expect more of, of course. And so um, it was mainly by shading and by clever insulation. So here's a video where Anne is going to describe that. My office faces south, so when it's forecast to be hot, I like to put up an awning that I made in 2010 to shade the window. I lean out, and hook some elastic loops at the top over hooks on the wall. Then two lengths of tube hold it out the bottom edge. I tension it all up with guy ropes attached to more hooks screwed into the outside wall at the bottom. It works very well and the shade keeps the room cool. We have a larger awning downstairs and this one is held out with guys to the garden fence. And so uh, this has been really effective. And um, in fact, a few weeks ago, um, somebody from B BBC came round and spent nearly all morning uh, interviewing Anne and taking photos, um, which was, seemed a lot of time, but it was really good. We got 23 seconds of video on BBC National News. It was the day IPCC had uh, published their latest report. So they wanted a video of somebody who was adapting to our new climate changing world. Um, so I think, I think that's me yeah. in this the, section. I must say that the day, the day after it was quite fun. I went to get my coffee in Cambridge Market and the lovely folks in the coffee store said, oh, I saw you on TV. Are you going to be a film star? 
and, and actually I need to be a lot better actress for, to, to make that my professional career. <laughs> so we should maybe say that we're going to have a few, a few minutes questions now and then I'll do the, the second half on the more recent stuff we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Siobhan, are you going to call on the questioners? Yeah, so we haven't got any questions in the chat, but if anybody would like to um, put any there. Or, or they could just stick their hands up. Okay. Way. I, have a I have a question, if I may. I was going to ask you what material the awning is made from. Okay, so it's, uh, as you probably saw, a, a fabric, it's, I think, nylon, but with a reflective, aluminized coating on the top so it really does uh, reflect the heat and we've said in the uh, uh, detailed document that you'll get to the de that, that we, you can download um, it comes from a um, north point? fabric called north is north point north point north it's north, called yeah, yeah. point north we, we buy quite a lot of materials for making uh, camping gear from them Okay, but what we did discover was, um, I think I think sort of cotton fabric would work quite well. But don't just try and use ordinary sort of nylon like you'd use for a tent, because actually what that does um, is it, it just sort of acts as a heat magnifier in the same way that a nylon tent does um, in the summer. Mm. We also we also have a plastic um, a, a clear polyphene one made out of just builders five hundred um, um, micron polyethylene. Which we've been using um, in in the lockdown time when one wants to be outside um, and it's pissing with rain, um, so it gets a little, a little bit more light in, in the winter, and that, that that's very nice too. So, so what's we've got a question here? We have a question, yes. If, oh yes. If, I don't know if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, I just wanted to know that. Um, in, in your opinion, um, out of the initial changes that you made, which do you think had um, made the biggest difference to um, yeah, energy saving in your home or what, which did you, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, so, well, you go ahead. Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'll give my take on it and then Tom may have a different one, but um, I, I mean, when we, we monitor the carbon emissions and I'll show you the graph later, but, the wood stove halved our carbon emissions um, because we did we deemed that it's zero carbon, which it probably is because we cut it all by hand and we it comes over on the bike trailer or something from fallen down trees and stuff out of neighboring skips and whatever. Um, but I think the main thing it did wasn't so much that it replaced all our heating, was it meant that instead of turning the central heating on at sort of four or five o'clock in the afternoon or because um, we found most of the house was perfectly warm, but it got cold when we were sitting in front of telly in the sitting room in the evening. So previously we turned the central heating on in order that it was warm when we sat down. Um, once we had the wood stove, we didn't bother to turn the central heating on at all because um, we were perfectly warm in the kitchen while we were cooking. And we just had the wood stove on when we settled down in the sitting room um, in front of the fire. So, so I think that basically that step hmm. it correlated with a very dramatic halving of our, of our bill, of our central heating emissions. We, we would... Um... You know, still use the gas central heating more widely in if it was freezing cold, yeah. but uh, not not in sort of not usually in November or March or those other months. So we have so another, shall I read this question out. Question? Yeah, shall I? Shall I read one? So what? A question to be read out from De Debbie Larad, um, who loves you at the awnings. Did you have any other open fireplaces or will you cover that in part two? And uh, she has a few and usually puts ch carrier bags with newspaper inside the chimney, but wonders if you have any tips. I, I, I think car carrier bags with newspaper in it is uh, a good idea. I'm told you, that you don't want to completely block um, a chimney because um, it probably is getting some rain in the top. Ideally, you put a cap on the top of the chimney pot because sure. uh, that stops the rain coming in. But even so, they do need to breathe a bit. And so don't try and do a complete seal job at the bottom like you might do just for draft reasons. But it makes an enormous difference doing that because otherwise 
which to me is designed to take or any warm air going and shoot it out the top of the chimney. That's its job, and it will be doing that to your centrally heated warm air if you don't block it or nearly completely block it. So I think I mean, the short answer is yes, we did have lots of other fireplaces, typical Victorian house, you know, fireplace in every room, um, and we blocked them all up. Um, and I have got this horrible sneaking feeling that we probably haven't left really enough ventilation, you know, up where we blocked them up because some of them had a sort of steel plate on. Um, I, I feel we probably really ought to be allowing a bit more ventilation up there. Um, uh, I have a, a question um, which is about ventilation actually. In terms of your underfloor um, insulation, did you have to take that into account, the ventilation, and make sure that you didn't block up the any ventilation in the walls? Yes, that's right. And so with the, with the uh, 200 millimeter thick fiber insulation we used um, that was going to get in the way of one of the air bricks at the front of the house and so we made a little kind of duct to make sure that air from that air brick still got under the vent ventilation and the fact that it was fiber insulation was good so that the the, um, the joists uh, could still breathe uh, any moisture out into the uh, ventilated space. Where we stuck or fixed the uh, Celotex under the floorboards, of course that's not breathable really in the same way, but at least the, um, the, the whole bot bottoms of the joists, bottom mm. third of the joists maybe, were still um, open to the air. So we figured that would probably let them breathe enough and the floorboards themselves breathe into the house more, I think. Yeah. And um, we did the we have a kitchen extension like like you know every you know, all tourist houses do. Um, and when we moved in and did some original work on that, we they put a concrete floor in one bit of it, an insulated slab, and we but we made damn sure they put a, a, a pipe along it so that where previously there was air bricks. It was it was continuing to be actually venting the underfloor so that the main sort of body of the terraced house has um, airflow under the floor going from front to back, sort of as it would originally have done. And I think sometimes people get a problem when they they do work in the sort of the kitchen extension type bit and they effectively block up air bricks, and then you don't get a through flow of air um, through. But I would say that when we did the took up the, kit, the, the sitting room floor to do that underfloor insulation, the job did take a day or two longer than we thought, because uh, we discovered that the front of the sitting room floor by the bay window, there was a reason why the floor had always been a bit wobbly there. <laughs> um, and so we had to go in, down to, to Ridgens or somewhere and, and, and get some more tantalised um, timber to re replace that. some of the rotten bits. But I'm very glad we did then, rather mm. than you know wait 10 years when there really would have been a big problem. Uh, the underlying problem was that there was damp soil against the bottom underground of the front. And um, so we dug out a trench there. We filled it with old bottles upside down and some, some stone on the top so that we kind of made sure the front of the house, the front wall uh, and underground for at least a foot or so was ventilated more. Except I'm now growing wild strawberries in it, and, and I'm not. I think they may be filling up some of the gaps. Oh, but... well, I I, I uh, pull them back sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a a hand raised from Benedict. If you'd like to ask your question. Yes, I've got a question about your energy sources. So, if you had to buy another, you know, to start again and buy a stove, considering the air pollution, would you buy, for example, a pellet stove? Um, as an alternative? No, well, no, I, I, we, we may not agree. Okay, what would your answer? <laughs> so so um, I wouldn't advise people to buy a, a regular log burning wood stove in the city, frankly, uh, in the countryside more so. But, but, it, but this is becoming a big problem. It's essential that you buy um, the highest spec stove. Ours was DEFRA approved, but now there is a European eco design standard, which means they release much less particulate pollution. 
Um, but the advantage of having pellet stoves is that they are a lot less pollution again, because they have a small combustion chamber where the combustion is kind of well regulated and hot within a small space with pellets coming through. And so um, that is less polluting. Yeah. But on the, on the other hand, um, all these things have a one hand and the other hand, um, you know, you're, you're, you're manufacturing and importing the pellets from, from, you know, quite a long way away, some of them made in the States, I think. Um, whereas when we, the sort of firewood that we get, um, it's come down from, you know, ash trees that's fallen down on, on Grange to Meadows or, or something like that. So it, it, the firewood is actually genuinely zero carbon instead of the sort of pretend zero carbon that sometimes you get with some of these pellets. Right. But I would agree with Tom. I think in a city, though, I mean, I, I deeply love having a stove um, and I was brought up with a stove uh, with an open fire and uh, it, it makes me go all cuddly. Um, I think it's probably not a good solution in a, in a city. But if you were living in a rural area, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it. interesting because I, I mean, I had uh, advice um, from a locality in France and there, the local um, uh, governmental agency is basically suggesting to use pellet stove, even if it's the middle of, uh, it's a rural area, mm -hmm. but they made a case for the pellet and I was wondering, and I think, yes, I mean, depends where you, and I'm surprised that you couldn't uh, source them locally because in this region, which is in Bourgogne, there's lots of wood around and a lot of the um, places which basically process wood make pellet as well. Mm. So you can I, have a local source. I, I think there are U UK pellets available now, but you'd want to check that. But I, I, I know maybe it's time for Anne to, to do her presentation, is it? So we have a couple more um, questions, but what I'm going to suggest is that we leave those until after the next section, if um, people are happy to, to hang on so that we can keep to time. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about the more recent stuff um, that we've been doing. Um, uh, I'm just sharing the slide. Um, it itself. So when okay. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just going to share the video now. Um, yeah, so um, in 2004, um, a couple of years after we'd bought the house, um, we did refurbish the kitchen, and you can see we had quite a lot of work done, um, which included taking out the whole end wall, taking everything off. And one thing we deeply regret, actually, is that at the time we, you know, we thought we were doing it pretty thoroughly. And but we didn't do solid wall insulation. We, we did insulate under this floor slab um, here. We insulated under the other end, which you can't quite see where I'm taking the photo from, which is a suspended wooden floor. Um, but I remember about a, about a week before the new kitchen was due to arrive, and they were just about to plaster the walls, I said, oh, Tom, do you think we should put solid wall insulation on, internal wall insulation? And it... it we decided not, it, it, partly because it was too late. It, 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 it was sort of, we hadn't thought of it much before, and we thought, oh, it will make the kitchen too small. And uh, know, let's go with what we first thought of. Um, well, we re regret it because we're now, what is it, 17 years later, actually doing it. And it, yes, it's one of these things we should have maybe thought more deeply about future proofing it when we were doing that work, but it's also perhaps a way of. The way that even those of us who are sort of thoroughly into this um, you know, low carbon stuff, you know, things will keep changing. So we won't have actually finished for quite a while, I think. And, and we put in um, high spec um, argon fill, double glazing, sash windows. Um, and, um, and now we're replacing some of those um, with, um, with, tri with triple glaze. So, um, what our, the project that I'll tell you about is what we call the extension upgrade project. Um, uh, again, okay. Um, and so our motto now is basically no half measures. We, we try to do things as properly as we can. So this is the back of the house um, as it was a couple of months ago. And, and you can see here is the windows that we put in in 2004. Um, this is my study window that you saw me leaning out of putting the, the awning up is actually the, the original 
Um, but I, we had some DIY secondary glazing on it. This was a loft extension we had in 2015. And we, we and our neighbors did it identically together, same architect, same builder. So our side looks just like that. And these are these, um, are these are set this more or less the same modern double glazed sash windows that, that we have here. Um, and then at the start of the um, upgrade project, in um, February 2020, um, we actually installed an air-to-air -air heat pump, and I'll show you about show you more about this in, the, in in a moment. But it's it's much smaller than a you might say a full-size um, air-to-water system. But we discovered these when we were visiting Tom's brother, um, and realised how common they were in Tasmania. So an a, a, an air-to-air heat pump, which is heating the the kitchen area, which is the coldest bit of the house. We've actually got eight new doors and windows. Um, six of the windows are replacing things like this. Um, and two, we've had also had two new Velux windows up there. And in this kitchen area, um, we're doing internal and external insulation. And then the whole side wall of the house down here, we're doing external wall insulation. So it's going to look, it'll be white like, like our neighbors, but, but actually coming, out, coming right over to, to, to here. Um, so that's the project. Um, February 2020 was an interesting time to start a big building project, or not as big as some people in open eco homes, but um, quite big for us. So this is the air to air heat pump. Um, then they're not common in the UK, and but we think that for certain applications they are great. Um, it, uh, I mean, you may say, well, it looks like an air conditioner. Here's the outside unit. Here's the internal unit. And because actually in a hot country, they would be used as an air conditioner and whisper it quietly. This can be used as an air conditioner, too. Um, it is completely silent for the internal unit when it's on its most gentle setting. It has four settings. Um, the outer unit has what our next door neighbor describes as a slightly industrial hum. And I think she's pretty much right. You can see we've tried adding some some a polyethylene acoustic foam on either side. I don't think that does a lot at all. Um, we have this summer um, added a lid to it because one thing we read was that if you have a heat pump and water is dripping from your gutter into the back of the heat pump evaporator, this is the same if you have an air to water one, that then makes it want to defrost more often, which reduces the efficiency. And so actually our neighbor's gutter does drip into this corner. There's a rather complicated arrangement there. So um, I thought much the simplest solution was to make a little roof um, for it. So I'll be very interested to see this winter whether we get better thermal performance because we've had the roof um, than, we, than we did before. So um, I thought it might be useful to compare the performance or the advantages and disadvantages of air to air and air to water. Uh, um, oh, I should say, by the way, if you've, got, if you've got any questions, shove, shove them in chat and Siobhan will pick them out at the, at, at the end. So, you know, as we go along. Um, so with the air to air, the coefficient of performance um, is actually 5.1, which for those of you who know about air to water heat pumps is great. It's a nearly twice the efficiency of an air to water one because it's producing warm air at, let's say, 25C. Um, we tend to set the thermostat at 18. Um, as opposed to having to produce hot water to go into your central heating system at 55. And even then that needs extra large radiators. It's cheap in comparison to an air to water one. An air to water one is typically 10K by the time you've fiddled around with all your plumbing um, and put extra hot water tanks in and um, et cetera. This was 2,250 2, quid from Anglian Energy Solutions. And it was installed in a morning. Um, um, and I'm saying very small print. It can be used as an air conditioner. We promise ourselves we won't unless in utter extremis. Uh, we haven't actually done that at, at all yet. Um, the disadvantages is that it heats our large kitchen living room brilliantly. Um, I am sure one of these would heat the small two bedroom house, terraced house that I lived in before Tom and I got together. You don't get the renewable heat incentive. Uh, but, but that's OK, because actually the renewable heat incentive it, you know, depends on how much heat you're actually using. And if you're not using very much heat because you've got a well insulated house, you don't get much RHI. It's air to air, so it isn't doing your hot water. So you've got to have some other solution for your hot water. And we still have the gas boiler. Um, 
in when the gas boiler dies, which unfortunately is a when, not an if, because it is 20 years old now, um, even though it's a, it's a top, it's on, it's a very good Bosch combi, um, we will probably go to using direct electric and maybe something like a sun amp that um, Andy at Rankin was talking about in his open eco home um, last week. Um, um, instead of a gas boiler, but at the moment we're still sort of keeping a sort of hybrid system. Um, and there's no heat storage. So when it's in its defrost mode, it stops blowing out warm air and ultimately and it, and that the, the room might get start to get a bit, feeling a bit cold. Uh, whereas if you've got a uh, air to water system, effectively all the, the, the central heating pipes and hot water and everything like that is is a sort of heat sort of short term heat storage system. So you don't notice it so much, I think, when it's in its defrost mode. So, you know, my conclusion is, is actually, you know, you look at lots of parts of the world where these things are, they're really, um, yeah, they're really popular and I think they deserve more attention in the UK. So this is our energy over the, um, the last, um, last few years from when we moved in. And this is what the difference the wood stove made. So you can see the gas and the electric, the gas is the red, you know, really did more or less halve. And we put the heat pump in here. It's not made a lot of difference to our carbon emissions so far but it's made less, we're using less gas and more electricity. But I'd say I'll be interested to see what happens. So the rest of the project, the doors and windows um, finally arrived. Um, and um, uh, after a long way, a long way for planning, long way for them being made in Eastern Europe, we got them from Green Building Store. Um, we knew there was gonna be a lot of mess. So we screened off half our kitchen with some more um, polythene um, and then we start the seriously messy bit um, we decided that we wanted to have fewer doors and windows because originally this room actually had rather a lot so you can see the heat pump here the kitchen door was here and is busy being bricked up there was a window here so we moved basically moved the door aperture to the window and unfortunately the the width wasn't quite right. So they had to then cut themselves um, a, a bit of a new opening to basically enlarge the window opening. You can see here, this is the kitchen window that's been put in. And we've deliberately put the, in, the windows in the outside skin. So they're going to be sit, basically sitting in the outside external insulation because that gives you better performance. Um, and um, when it actually came to it, actually putting the doors and windows in was really quick. It was sort of a couple of hours each. Um, and you know, some of these things I've been sort of worried about would take forever, and they didn't. And this is the pipe from the heat pump. Um, we got back into the room um, for Christmas, and you can see the blocked up door. Here's our new green building store door. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that was okay. And this thing about putting the, when the external insulation in the external skin, definitely gives you better thermal performance. And so here you can see we actually slightly raised the window, made it a little bit smaller than it had been. That's just a bit of timber that fills up the space. Um, partly because so, so the window wouldn't get wouldn't get messed up with the taps. Um, um, and then um, and you get these nice wide window sills by doing this, which, which personally I'm really keen on. And I haven't really thought about that in advance, um, but I think it's lovely. This is a Ventaxia ventilation heat exchange um, fan we have. Um, it works pretty well. It, it's, um, you know, it's simpler than putting in full MVHR. Um, we had new Velux after a bit of dithering um, with our old Velux. The problem was they were leaking. Uh, we could have replaced the seals um, or we could have upgraded the, the glazing a little bit but that wasn't giving us much benefit. Um, so we actually decided to do the, to go the full hog and actually put in top spec um, modern Velux windows, which have quite a lot of insulation around here. Um, and I was just say, and we used um, um, Giles Harrison's company um, to do this, who are the local Velux specialists and, and I'm very pleased with what they did. Um, very quick, again, just took, took a day. And, and it's improved the insulation value of the windows from 1.8 to 0 0.83. Um, so, so that was, again, easier than I thought it was going to be. And then basically in May, we started the, um, 
the, the internal insulation in the kitchen because some of it was external, some of it was internal, which made it meant all the plaster comes off. A mess, what a mess. Um, they then lime rendered it, and you can see this wall was actually breeze blocks. So you can see the, the pattern there. And it was all pretty irregular. Um, is that we put in wood fiber insulation. In some places, we put in two layers um, where the partly sort of covering up the, the unevenness in the wall, partly where the, we knew it was going to be a bit colder. Um, we chose wood fiber here rather than polystyrene, EPS because um, you know, the kitchens are always sort of kind of a damp place. And we have a gully between us and the neighbors up about here, which has in the past leaked. We, we think we've fixed the leak, but just in case we hadn't, we wanted to have a breathable uh, material. And we did think about whether to have, um, 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 I'm just, Tom, Tom's reminding me where, where I'm meant to be. Um, oh yeah, okay, yes, I'm, 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 I, need to, I need to get a move on. Um, we did wonder whether to have um, aerogel because I was very worried about the fact that there'll be a, if we use thick insulation, there'll be a step here. And, and actually, um, personally, I don't think it matters at all. I'll be interested in your views afterwards. And I guess one of my learnings is that change is okay. And you fret about things and think they're going to be dreadful and it's actually fine. And somehow having moved the door from here, our room feels bigger. It's, you know, really another unexpected bonus. Um, we like making use of recycled materials. So this is the floor in my study. We had it all taken up because there was an air leak somewhere under the floor. When we moved in, the carpet used to billow with when it was windy. And we discovered that there was an enormous hole between us and our next door neighbors where an RSJ had been put through. Um, and so we squirted, they squirted some foam in it. Um, the air leak went away um, and we could no longer hear every word that she said in her room. And then I spent the Christmas lockdown basically repairing floorboards um, and filling up little holes, which is a job I actually really quite enjoy. It's, it's quite a nice sort of thing to do. Then we've got a, the professionals with a sander to polish it. And so this is what I now have as my, my office floor where we're currently sitting. Um, so I was very pleased with that. Um, the external insulation is about to start. Um, in fact, it is starting today. Um, here's the insulation. Well, actually this is the wrong insulation that was unfortunately delivered last week. Um, we have Kingspan Phenolic, which is going underneath, 60 millimetres thick, except they delivered 50. And then here we have grey, 30 millimetres EPS, which is going to go on top. So we get the good performance of the phenolic um, and the easier rendering of the EPS. Um, and we've just been playing around with a special guttering system, which is this EWI Pro guttering. And we were very inspired by this drawing. This is, in an architect magazine that Margaret Reynolds showed us about um, as to how you do this top detailing. And we bought it actually a year ago from EWI Pro just to start a lockdown because the guy was thinking he might be retiring his business. And this is how the gutter goes. Here's the insulation, here's the wall, here's the roof. Um, um, we're currently, this, this, this afternoon, we were up the scaffolding trying to work out the details of how it goes. And Brian was very helpful on the phone. Um, retrofit. We, we call this a live-in retrofit, so we, we don't, you know, move out when we do these things. Um, um, here's Tom, nicely installed um, in our bedroom. Um, um, here are my filing cabinets from, from my study. Um, and it was actually easier than we expected, because you, even though it took much longer than we expected, you can get more or less used to anything. Um, and also, the thing was that there was large periods where we were just like, kind of waiting for things to happen. Um, here's the COVID graph, um, and the red bits are where we're waiting for some things to happen, and the blue bits are where they're actually doing work. So this would have been deeply frustrating if we'd been out there in some rental house, particularly if we'd only rented it for six months and the whole job still hadn't been finished in a year. Um, and I think probably having these gaps here with pandemics and pandemics and whatever has actually made the builder fatigue a bit less bad than it normally is. I, I tend to need five years between a major retrofit stage. So do we notice a difference? Um, well, we think when we finish the external insulation, our energy use should reduce by two thirds. That's in, this is in the, in the kitchen living room bit, uh, which is mostly due to the wall insulation. Some of it due to the windows and, and Velux. Um, quite a bit due to having a new door. We just had an old, you know, traditional panel door. In fact, when it was only a 2021 one, but it was a sort of panel door and some of it due to re reduced air leakage. 
And I have a little thing that I've lost, which um, we'll talk about it later. I'll be later what I use to, to measure airflow and I'll find it. Um, in general, it feels more comfortable because the temperatures are more uniform. Um, the kitchen feels bigger because we've taken out one of the doors, which also has improved the thermal performance. We've got no more leaks. We've got nice polished floors, fresh paint, less clutter because we had to clear things out for the builders. Okay, I'm a bit over time. Um, any questions? So we have a question on the uh, where the windows uh, are come from, and I've put a link in the chat there from the case study. Uh, the case study um, has got links to all of the suppliers of, 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 of things. Um, there's a question from John Somerville. Would you like to unmute and ask your question, John? Hello there. Can you see and hear? Yes. Hello. Um, yeah, so we've been, we've similar sort of renovation energy usage is now quite low. Um, we have a gas boiler and a heat pump, like an air to water heat pump seems like quite a big jump, particularly given our boiler is quite good. Um, so we've also been considering a air to air heat pump, but it's something we've not really experienced. So I've looked at a split unit with one internal upstairs um, one downstairs and a unit, I guess, similar to yours um, outside. Um, but I guess there's a slight fear of the unknown there. So mm -hmm. how long does it take to defrost? How often does it do it? Does it feel drafty? Anything else? Amazing. Yeah. I think with so ours, um, I mean, ours, we've got a Hitachi um, and I think it's a very good one. Some of them apparently sort of kind of, they start themselves off defrosting at intervals that they've just you know it's almost like it's on a time clock and i think they apparently they do it a lot um ours actually has something i think it's looking at the refrigerant flow or something so it actually only defrosts when it thinks it needs it you know when it really detects it needs it so i think that makes it you know much much better um i think you know having this lid will will help um what i think i realized and also, I mean, kind of, because they're kind of unusual things. It, it, it's taken us a while to learn it. We're still learning, learning about it too. It's very nice having the gas central heating as a backup. If I, you know, again, this sort of uncertainty factor. Um, um, though we, we didn't use the gas much, much last winter at all. Um, so, um, I think, I think this winter, I think it won't do so, the defrosting so much. The time when it does most defrosting is when it's sort of five centigrade outside and at one of those sort of damp, claggy days, because it's high humidity and it's 5C, so the air passing over the heat, heat exchanger evaporator can actually freeze. If you are above 10 degrees C outside, there's no icing. And I think if you're below minus 10 or maybe minus five, there's no icing because it's because the air's quite dry. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, the sort of Cambridge winter February temperature is when we're going to get most problems with the with the icing. Um, and yeah, and then it was probably in its defrost mode, I, I guess, once a day. Um, oh, right. OK. You know, it's, it wasn't all the time, but because I was a kind of not really no, I hadn't quite clocked. There's a little symbol which says it's defrosting. And I hadn't quite clocked what that was. So. Um, um, so I guess that means you didn't really even notice when it was doing it to some extent, which is most of the time no. But if it was when it was sort of kind of five and claggy, and then it spent twenty minutes defrosting or something, I'm like, oh, it was it's getting a bit cold. Um, but but we certainly didn't notice big drafts. You know, it wasn't like you're sitting in front of a fan heater. Um, and I say when the setting of this was on its setting one, uh, the, the light it was silent and you didn't feel any. You didn't really feel any air movement. But I think probably um, you know, maybe invite, invite, invite you around to experience it later in the winter when we've, we've, we've got it, when we're using it. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. So we have um, a, a couple more questions in the chat and also we have um, someone with their hands up. I'm aware that we're getting quite short of time, um, but perhaps if we could ask uh, Jeff Hale to unmute and ask your question. Okay, um, just for 
looking back at your use of Celotex, which you used in, the, in your loft and under your floor, which I did similarly in the loft, I just wondered, have you ever come across any worries about um, the fire resistance of it, um, especially Sorry. given Grenfell Tower? I don't think there is a problem, but it sort of niggles in the background. Yeah, no, uh, Salatex did not come out well out of the uh, ongoing Grenfell inquiry. They, they were definitely ignoring the fact that they'd had some failures in the tests. So that, that was really bad. But uh, I really don't think there's a danger in um, two or three story homes. I think it's only taller ones where there's a danger. And um, so I, don't, I, 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 I don't think it's such a problem. Of course, the Celotex is a kind of oil-based product. So it does have more of a carbon footprint than uh, some of the other products, particularly wool, for example. Or the wood, the wood fibre. Wood, wood fibre is, yes. Yeah, that's low, another reason for using the wood fibre internally, because of that sort of low embodied carbon, but um, it, it's not, you know, you need more thickness for the benefit. Um, and we're using phenolic and EPS on the outside, and the phenolic, of course, is completely fireproof uh, and very good insulation, um, much higher performance. Yeah, I mean, my rationale for using it in the, in the in the loft was the same as yours is that you don't need as much greater thickness and you can board over it a lot easier than, yeah. than yes. the other way but then storage and it, it worked in that respect it worked really well i think so and it's um it's no more flammable than a lot of other things we got in the loft really <laughs> yes okay, okay so thank you We've got a couple more questions, and I'm just wondering whether we want to actually just do the, the closing slides with the feedback um, and donations links, and then uh, if people want to stay on further, then they, they, they may. Shall we do that? Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Very happy to do more questions. Okay. So do you want me to share the rest of the, those slides? Yes. And finish off with the uh, wash-up slide, and then uh, if... People want to carry on. If you're happy to continue talking, um, we'll go with that. Can you see that now, David? Uh, yes, yes, see all of that, yes. So, can I talk to it? Yes, please. Right. So, it would really help us if you can give your feedback in this um, uh, drop form, I think. Siobhan will be putting the link to this in chat. Maybe you have yes, anyway, a link have. coming soon. So please, it would take you about five minutes to fill this, uh, to tell us what you have felt about tonight's tour. And hopefully we'll learn how to do these better and reach more people. And then, as David mentioned, Open Eco Homes is run by the charity Cambridge Carbon Footprint, and we really rely on donations to be able to carry on reaching us out to other people. We have some sponsors as well, which is great. So if you're able, um, please make a donation online, or if you already have, thanks very much. Do share um, your opinions if you're into social media. And then finally, there's um, another page of resources and um, as well about getting started with your retrofit if you're into that. And um, you've seen about case studies. I mentioned about the thermal imaging camera. So Cambridge Carbon Footprint. Oh yes, here's, here's one that we're, Anne's showing to you. Um, so Cambridge Farm Footprint has a couple of cameras a bit like this. Uh, and in early November, we'll start training sessions again. In a, in a couple of hours, um, we can show you how to use the camera and how to interpret the images. And then you can borrow a camera, it's all free, and um, have a look at your own home or hopefully, maybe you're up for looking at um, friends neighbours or community home buildings to show where they are leaking heat. It's really good at revealing that. 
And if you're into some political action, then uh, there is a, this new uh, project called Householders Declare. This is householders trying to put pressure on the government to actually do actually do something about home energy. Their, their uh, record so far is pathetic. So um, I hope that will make a difference. And just, just to remind everybody, if you have signed up to attend this actual uh, talk this evening, then you will be receiving links and more information through your email. So what we'd like to do is to uh, finish up probably a maximum of 15 minutes. I think is reasonable. Otherwise, people get rather tired of Zoom. And uh, I'll leave Siobhan to just um, finish off with some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, so if we've got a couple of questions here. Claire McRae, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes, thank you. It was a really good talk. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Um, slide 31, you had a really nice graph that showed the breakdown, I think, of your heat loss um, through different parts of the house. Okay. Or, and I thought that was, a, I think it was sort of the main question is, how did you get measurements that detailed that you could be so confident to produce that chart? How do you, where do you get the numbers from? Okay, um, that's not sorry, I find it's very distracting, Tom. Um, sorry, I'm trying to show you the slide. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't find 30, it. Slide 31, it's almost at the end. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are we sharing that? Don't think we are. Yes. You are. Okay, oh yeah, okay, yes. So basically, um, so I, I was actually very simple. Um, I mean, all, all I did was very simple in that um, um, I um, you know, did my own estimates. So um, the original wall, for example, I worked out what the area of the wall was that wasn't windows, just with a tape measure. Um, and the original wall was, I think the U value is about 2.2 for a solid brick wall. Um, I forget quite where I got that figure from, but I'm online somewhere. Um, and then with the insulation, we knew what U value we were, we were aiming for, which is, oh God, I'm going to get the number wrong. Can't remember. I think it's about 0.2 or something. Can't quite remember. I've, I've, got a, I've got a table with what we had originally and what we're aiming for, given the thickness of the insulation we've got. And then, for example, the Velux windows. Actually, I, I asked Velux what I thought the old, they thought the U value of the old windows was because they're not made anymore. And, you know, the new windows, it was, you know, I could see what it was in the catalogue and I multiplied that by the area of the window. And you can see the heat loss I've done here is the watts per K, which basically means the watts lost per degree centigrade difference between internal and external. Um, and um, what gave me the confidence to do it? Well, I started my career as a mechanical engineer doing heat transfer calculations. Um, so, uh, um, but it, it's actually very simple. Anybody can do it. It's just, you know, you just need to be able to, you know, use a calculator or a spreadsheet, and it, it isn't. You know, it's very helpful in seeing where the, um, you know, where the where the problems are. Okay, we Thank have you. a couple of questions from Sibby. One of those is about suppliers, and all of the supplier links are in the case study. Would you like to ask your other question, Sibby, please? Um, yes, I, I'm wondering whether you know um, various people suggest that you could use sheep's wool for insulation. And um, I'm not sure whether you considered that. Uh, and and if, if, you, if you did consider it and decided not to use it, I'm very interested in why not. So, so we, yes, we, we have used sheep's wool a bit. In our um, original, um, we had a kind of 1960s loft extension it was uh, very cold in winter and hot in summer and quite a small space. And um, some of the ceiling was kind of, um, un it wasn't insulated, it was uncovered. So you could still have, you could see the uh, roof joists horizontal above. And so we filled the space in between those with sheep's wool and held them up with kind of fishing line. It was a, it was a decorative feature. So you could <laughs> see the uh, sheep's wool. And actually that got replaced in the end. But um, the slightly worrying thing, this was thermofleece wool. They claim it is uh, protected from clothes moth, 
by uh, mm. having a car yeah. axe with it. Yes, I mean, that was one of my my concerns, actually. So we did discover, actually, some of this wool afterwards when we had a really close look at it, because we do have a problem with clothes moth in this house, and the sheep's wool did have clothes moth in it, I'm yeah. afraid. Yeah, clothes moth larvae and stuff. So, and that was after about 15 years. And what I've heard in discussing it with other people is that the borax stuff probably works for the first five years or so, and then maybe it doesn't work so well. And I think they've changed the treatment, but I don't think they can guarantee yet, to be okay. honest, whether it, whether it really okay. works. So, so we're actually taking out the sheep's wool. Yeah. Um, if anybody would like some sheep's wool with the odd um, <laughs> Christmas of, of clothes well, moth. Well, well, having had a serious clothes um, a moth in, infestation, which we had to get somebody in to, to sort out, you know, I, I thought that might be one reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you for that. There was a scandal, um, it was widely reported in the press a few years back, because a design, uh, what do they call it? Um, the the uh, on telly series. Grand designs. Grand designs. Design. That's what I mean. One of our super super homes uh, with lots of sheep's wool insulation was uh, badly infested, and this was a big scandal. One thing I, one thing I meant to show you, um, folks, before was um, I've got the DIY way of detecting air leaks. Um, and, and this was, so for example, bef before we put the plasterboard, the, the insulation up in the kitchen area, I basically went around the sort of old brickwork um, looking for gaps and stuff, of which there are all sorts of gaps. So basically what I do is I, I take a piece of um, plastic, of, of, of film, and, and I mean, it can be a back of a crisp packet. This happens to be a bit of a coffee packet. And I, and I make a little sort of thing on a, on, this is on a kebab stick. And it's incredibly sensitive. The tip just flitters around um, if it's in a draft. So now Tom's going to pretend to be a draft, and so because it shines, um, you can see it very easily. So, so something like this: if you've got builders in, and tell them you, you're going to be fussy about air leakage, and then go around like this, particularly if it's windy, and find the air leaks, and then put squirty foam in, and it, it makes a big difference. So when we did our loft extension together with our next door neighbours, I did a lot of this. The builders were really fed up with me. Um, and the, and she didn't. Um, and at the end, she was saying to me, "says well, it's quite drafty up in the attic, isn't it?" <laughs> and I, I shouldn't have been smug, but I did say, "Well, art isn't." <laughs> we, did, we did warn the builders because we also used a the thermal imaging camera, and um, we found that there was they would started putting floorboards back in this uh, loft extension, and we knew that there was meant to be insulation under them. Partly for, you know, if we if we didn't want to heat, the, if the room was empty and we didn't heat it, but also um, for sound insulation between the floors. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't done it, but at least we caught that before they'd gone much further and it was pretty easy for them to remedy. It was funny, our builders were overheard in the garden on the phone, one of them, I'm talking about that bloody woman. <laughs> <laughs> but um. We're all, all, also, we, we don't link to these people in our uh, case study, but we, in the case study, we do link to Green Hat Construction, Tim Atchison's business, and uh, they are the thorough case. and understand these issues. Yeah, um, and they're the people who are doing the current extension, and we're, we're very pleased um, with them. Um, I think that's a great tip to warn the builders that you're going to be checking for, for, yeah. for drafts. Yeah, because um, it, no, it really is a good, it's a good, it is a good tip. I'm glad you pointed it out because it's towards the end they started saying, "Oh, we want to charge you extra because of all this, you know, all this fiddling around and all this ceiling you wanting us to do." I said, "Well, we told you in person and in writing when you were asked you to quote that we would be picky about this." And the thing is, they didn't believe us. <laughs> We have just one more question in the chat, and that is from Claire Waters, if you'd like to unmute. Hi, Tom. Hi, um, I was curious about your bathroom unit with the um, heat recovery that you, you, in fact, Anne, I think, was talking about it, um, because I'm thinking about uh, maybe getting external wall insulation at some stage, and I suspect we've already got some condensation issues so we've already got a PIV unit. There's no underlying issues. We just, it's just something that happens apparently. Um, 
so anyway so I, I had sort of in my head uh, and I'm looking for Margaret Reynolds to help me actually as well if, if she ever has time for it she's a very Good. busy lady um but anyway I had presumed that I might need to go the full mechanical heat ventilation yada 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 and so, um, now I'm thinking oh is it possible because it's some of the bedrooms are the ones it's not bad bad condensation there's no mold mm. but there's definite condensation on the windows I'm just wondering would, so would all, all we have is a what looks a bit like an extractor fan in our bathroom yeah and it's is it a ventaxia, ventaxia. it's a ventaxia um, and I, can't I think it was about 120 quid. I mean, it was actually something my brother had bought um, and he bought a bit too, ma too many and, you know, he had a spare one, so he, he gave it to us, you know. Um, I wouldn't put it in a bedroom, though, because it's actually quite, quite noisy. Hmm. Uh, okay. you know, it, it's not as noisy as a full blast extractor fan going off full speed, but, but it's too noisy That's for a bedroom. Really you, you do get these sort of trickle, trickle ones, which hmm. are very, very quiet. So, so they, yeah. this Vendaxi one claims to recover 80%. Of, of the heat that's being blown out of your room. Um, so that, that's quite good. When, when it's going at its slower speed, it has a boost speed as well, which does sound a bit like an aircraft. Yeah. Um, so it's good in the bathroom, I'd say, but I wouldn't recommend it for a bedroom. In the bedrooms. Okay. I'm, I'm sure Margaret will it. advise you on better solutions. I mean, she's done yeah. some stuff with James's house, hasn't she? Mm. I hope that maybe windows with trickle vents better than we've got yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we, I mean, we've been doing some monitoring in our bedroom, and if we have the window, the door shut, um, yes, you know, the CO two levels build up to quite a, an ex excessive degree, and we get a lot of condensation on the window. And if we have the door open, um, then it doesn't. And um, well, you know, we're in a, the household in our household situation, we're able to leave the door open. Um, obviously, in some cases, one one can't. And so we leave um, the doors open. It's yeah. still yeah, because the piv, piv units outside in the hallway, so that's to try and blow the air right the way through the house, sort of. Thing. Yes, that, that's good. Yeah. So maybe I can give advance notice uh, that um, Cambridge Carbon Footprint has recently bought two carbon dioxide monitors. And they're particularly useful for checking if your ventilation is adequate, because um, you know the the inhabitants of, of the room, including pets and anything breathing out, is increasing the carbon dioxide. And so, if that doesn't, if that accumulates and your concentrations go up, that's showing it's stuffy, and it's actually bad for your health to have carbon dioxide levels above sort of 1500 parts per million it starts to get a bit of concerning um hse say at work it mustn't go over 5000 um but anyway you could you the, we, before long we will be lending out these carbon dioxide monitors to also log the um carbon they measure carbon dioxide humidity and temperature and so you can, um, you know, find out what the carbon dioxide level in your bedroom, say, has been overnight, uh, and um, see what's going on. It's what, when we when we used it in the sitting room, trying it out. Um, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll have it even. I mean, we haven't got the fire on them because it's, you know it's obviously it doesn't need it. But we tend to have the sitting room door shut, just sort of out of habit, really. And we realised that actually, with the two of us sitting there, you know, breathing away reading our books or watching telly or whatever, the CO2 level really did build up. So we now tend to leave the door open. Um, and we find we don't quite so much want to just drop off to sleep immediately, which is good. <laughs> yes, it may, higher levels of CO2 do make you drowsy. We're wondering, or is it just um, me getting drowsy in, in the evenings? <laughs> if we want to get to the last question, is time's getting on now quite significantly. And so there's a... We just have one uh, hand ra raised from Benedict, if you could ask your question, but we've have just three more minutes, so it's uh, it'll be quite a quick one, please. Hello, yes, I, I've got a question about internal wall insulation. So we have a Edwardian uh, home from 1901, and at the moment we've got lovely ventilation because of 
or windows are single glazing and, and we have no internal insulation. Um, so it's a very drafty, um, but probably zero, no, no, not a lot of carbon dioxide <laughs> accumulation. But we, so we, we are about to go and want to change our windows. So having new windows, uh, with double glazing uh, made to reproduce the old windows because they, they are lovely. And because we want to do that, we have to make a decision if we do the internal wall insulation or not at the same time. And I, I, we were struggling with a decision because it's the point of ventilation and, and having dry walls and, and uh, I know there are problems. We have to be careful with internal insulation because you can actually, you could generate some uh, water in the wall. So we thinking of using wood fibers, uh, so pavadri, yes. uh, but I'm still worried. <laughs> so actually, I mean, we, we, you have to put the, the, the new windows in first, so we could just do that. Mm. Yeah, so, so you, you could, um, you know, I think doing your windows, which, would happen mainly from the outside, could be done separately from doing your internal insulation? Uh, well, well it, the, the idea would be to redo the old window. So what we've been told, actually is green hat construction has been told is that we have to, then you have to choose the thickness of the window. Okay. So you have to make the decision if you go for the, either the, the internal insulation or not. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think, uh, you know, you're right that there are risks with, um, uh, particularly if your internal insulation is not breathable, that, that may trap moisture. So it's, it's, I think it's good, particularly on the internal to be breathable. No? Well, I mean, if it's a damp room. Mm. So I mean, we actually, we, I mean, I, I really empathize with you. We, we, we agonize about this for, for years. Um, <laughs> And things that helped was one was we decided that we would do wood fiber in the kitchen because it's damp and we slight worries as to whether we've really fixed the gully um, above it. So wood fiber there, even though it's thicker. Um, in my study where we're, where we're sitting, um, this wall here, um, I mean, we can see that he, here is a new green building store um, window. It's a, it's a what they call a mock sash. Um, so it's actually, it's a sort of tilted window. The, the wall beside it, um, and here um, is um, um, polystyrene um, with plasterboard on top, um, and it was it made a lot of sense to do it at the same time. And we decided it was it was fine to do polystyrene thanks to some advice from I think it was Alex Rice, um, who's a Ebony Combs involved person, um, because it's a dry it's a pretty dry room. It's just my study. Um, it's not a bathroom or anything. Um, and the the way the floorboards go, um, the, um, the, 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 the 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 wall is like this, and the joists are like this. So you're not got joists going into um, a sort of end wall um, that you're you're insulating. And you know, take putting the windows in is pretty quick, but actually it's it's a fairly it's a pretty messy because they do take some of the plaster off. So they might as well take it all off and put some put this sort of insulated plasterboard up instead. And and actually it it, it was. Yeah, it was much as hard than I thought it was going to be. I well, think thank you, well. Tom and Emma. Uh, I think we ought to leave it there because you've done a sterling job. The numbers oh. are starting to go down now. Um, yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much to everybody for coming along, and thank you particularly to our two speakers this evening for a most fascinating talk. Um, there is another, there are some further talks in this series, and uh, if you'd like to come along on Saturday, that's the second, we're going to go from an Edwardian structure to a pacifist house living. Uh, and that's on Saturday, the 2nd of October. So um, thanks once again to everybody for coming, particularly our speakers. And we're going to shut down now as uh, we're way past the time we sort of allocated. So thanks, everybody. And I'm going to shut down for this evening and hope to Bye. see you sometime. Cheerio. Bye. Bye, everybody.